This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. All right, men, flip over and go with me to Philippians. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. Simple verse in its truths, but profound in application and in expansion from the rest of the scriptures. As you're finding your place there, let me open up with just a few words of introduction. Let me start by asking you this question. How on earth can anyone overcome the fear of death? How can anyone overcome the fear of death? Last week I taught the children in our church history class at our homeschool co-op. I taught them about John Rogers. If you haven't ever heard of John Rogers, you need to study into his life and especially look at the way that he died. Rogers was the first Englishman who was martyred under the reign of Bloody Mary. John Rogers is actually the guy who first published the English translation of the Bible from the original languages because Tyndale was strangled and burned to death before he completed the Old Testament translation. So Rogers, who had worked with Tyndale, ends up translating the rest of the Old Testament, and then he's the first one who publishes it. It's called the Matthews Bible. And Rogers then gets to publish it, and he wasn't put to death for translating or publishing the scriptures like Tyndale was. The Lord changed the king's heart as Tyndale prayed with his last breath. He prayed, oh Lord, open the king of England's eyes. He did. So Rogers gets to publish it. And then Rogers gets in trouble again because he preached against the Roman Catholic view of the Lord's Supper. That Christ is re-crucified every time that they partake in mass. And so he preached against that and preached what the scriptures actually say about the Lord's Supper, that it is a spiritual feast, but not in any way a physical one and no re-crucifixion of Christ. So they arrest John Rogers, they put him in jail, and then finally they're leading him out, and apparently he was number one on Mary Tudor's hit list. She wanted John Rogers to be killed first. So he's being led to the stake, to be set on fire and burned to death. And this is what John Fox, who wrote Fox's Book of Martyrs, this is what he records. When the time came that he should be brought out to the place of his execution, one of the sheriffs first came to Mr. Rogers and asked him if he would revoke his abominable doctrine and the evil opinion of the sacrament of the altar. Mr. Rogers has this sheriff come to him, and he even brings with him the pardon freshly drawn up by the queen. He says, here is your pardon. If you will recant, your life will be spared. And we're talking about the Lord's Supper. If you'll recant, your life will be spared. He holds it in front of him. And then Rogers says, that which I have preached, I will seal with my blood. And they lead him the rest of the way to be burned at the stake. And the profound thing of what's happening is his friends, fellow saints, gather around and they know when he's going to be killed. So they're gathering around and cheering him on as he goes to burn. Now, keep in mind, this is the first Englishman that's being burned under Bloody Mary's reign. This is not like a bunch of people have had this happen. This is the first one. And they're cheering him on, encouraging him. And he has 11 children one of which he hadn't even met yet because he was in prison. And all of his children are in the crowd as well. And they're cheering him on as he goes to be burned at the stake. He looks at the sheriff and says, what I've preached I'll seal with my blood. Then this is what a man who is there, who I believe is from Italy, he's there, he's an eyewitness of this. He writes a letter back to his home country a few days later because he was... He saw what happened at Roger's death. He says, Roger's died persisting in his opinion. At this conduct, the greatest part of the people took such pleasure that they were not afraid to make him many exclamations to strengthen his courage. Even his children assisted at it, comforting him in such a manner 
that it seemed as if he had been led to a wedding. Rogers is marching to his death, and this onlooker, who doesn't necessarily agree with what Rogers is doing, saying he persisted in his opinion, and the profound thing is that his children are cheering him on with such joy that it seems like they're leading him to a wedding celebration, not to the stake. How can Rogers face death like that? And how can his children even cheer on their dad as he goes to be set on fire? And the answer is Philippians 1.21. They knew it. They believed it. For me, Paul says, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Rogers and all the other men that were martyred, they knew that truth. They knew that death is gain for the believer. And the profound thing, I think, about that story is the fact that Rogers had instructed his wife and his children so much that his wife brings all of the children to the place where her husband is going to be killed. And the children aren't just there weeping, they're cheering their dad on and saying, you can do it, be faithful to Jesus, you're going to be with Jesus soon. This, This is what you and I should all desire our wives, and our children to do. They know because Christ died to kill death that death is now a gain for believers. I want you to make that your prayer, that your children would love Jesus so much they would lead you to your death rejoicing knowing that dad's about to be with Jesus and we will be someday too. They knew what this text teaches. Look at it in your own Bible. Paul says, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. To die is a benefit, is what he's saying. So what I simply want to do is just point out that first part to you and then ask the question, why is the death of a believer gain? I don't think that I'm going to tell you anything you don't already know tonight. So if you're curious about new information, you're probably not going to get anything new. But men, would you please just meditate on these great truths that are revealed in the scriptures of why death is gain for we who belong to Christ? I'm going to exhort you to, when we're finished, to meditate upon them and then teach these truths to your wife and your children. They desperately need to know these and do it with the mindset of I want my children and my wife to know that death is gain in Christ, so much so that my wife would bring my children to my execution and my children would cheer me on as I died for Christ. Keep that in your mind. I want them to have such a clear understanding of why death is gain that they would respond like Roger's wife and children. So first truth, for the believer, life is Christ and death is gain. Life is Christ. He means for me to live is Christ. If I live, everything that I'm doing is for the glory of Christ, by the direction of Christ, through the power of Christ. Everything I'm doing is about the Lord Jesus Christ. To live, I mean, just think about the profound way he's even saying it. He's just saying to live is Christ. Life is Christ. It's not Christ is first and I am second. And, you know, all that kind of stuff. He's like, no, Christ is everything. Christ is first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and everything falls under the lordship of the Lord Jesus. To live is Christ, and to die is gain. So let's focus mostly on the second. Why is the death of a believer gain? First, I want you to consider, brothers, what freedom you will have from sin after death. Consider what freedom you will have from sin after you die. And you will see one of the reasons Paul says death is gain. First, after death, you will become free from any stain of sin. You will become free from any stain of sin. Ephesians 5, 27. Christ died to present the church to himself in splendor, 
without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. That will not be a concrete subjective reality for you until you die. Why is death gain? No more stain of sin. Secondly, after death, you'll be freed from the indwelling of sin. After death, you'll be freed from the indwelling of sin. Paul says in Romans 7, 23 and 24, sin dwells in my members. Sin dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? This is Paul post-conversion. This is not pre-conversion. This is him post-conversion. He says, I still have this indwelling sin. Who will deliver me from this body of death? And we know, ultimately, Christ will. That's why he says, thanks be to God. But in another sense, death will. Death will deliver you from this body of death, this indwelling sin. Thomas Boston says, Sin's reigning power is broken in sanctification. It no longer reigns over us, yet it still abides as a troublesome guest. But at death, sin is plucked up by the roots. No more indwelling sin for you, men, after you die. Third, after death, you will be free from any temptation to sin. No longer will sin just not only dwell in your members, you will not even be tempted. James 1.14 says, Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own lusts. But men, when indwelling sin lies in the ground with the body of death, and your souls rest perfectly in heaven with Christ, how can you be lured and enticed any longer by your evil lusts? You can't be. Temptation to sin will be gone when you die. Fourthly, after death, you will be free from any commission of sin. Not only, not only from the stain, from the indwelling of it, from temptation, but from ever committing sin again. In 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Paul says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And at your death, that will be complete. That will be complete. No longer committing sin. Fifthly, after death, you'll be free from the possibility of sin. From even the possibility of it. He says in Revelation 3.12, Christ in his letter to the churches. He says, to the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. The, the image is of a pillar that is stable and steadfast and will never move. I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. The possibility of sin will be gone. Sixthly, after death, you will be free from the presence of sin. You'll be free from the presence of sin. Revelation 21, 27. But nothing unclean will ever enter that holy city, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. The presence of sin will be banished. From the new heavens and the new earth, nothing unclean will ever enter it. So you need to first, there's a reason that I bring this up. Death is gain because of the total and complete freedom from sin. There's a reason I put that first. And it's so that you can examine yourselves. And you can teach that truth to others and tell them to examine themselves by it. All these six particulars that I've just pointed you to about being set free from sin, does that get you excited? Or as I'm going through these, you're just like, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Is it, or is it rather, I can't wait to not sin against my sovereign Savior any longer. That's a test, I think, that you can put before yourself and say, am I a Christian or not? An unbeliever would hear everything that I just told you and just go, that's why you think death is gain? 
And while they might be actually calling themselves a Christian, and say, how can you actually be born again and not hate sin and hate that which your Savior died for? But this is a test. See, how excited are you, men, that you will be completely free from sinning against God? Examine yourselves by that. If that is you, if you can say, oh man, I'm sick of sinning, then praise the Lord. Because that is not what the natural man thinks. That's not what the natural man loves. That's not what the natural man hates. He doesn't hate sin. But if you do, that's evidence that God himself has caused you to be born again. He's given you a new mind, a new will, new affections. So praise the Lord and rejoice, men. One day, sin itself will have a funeral. You'll lay flowers on its grave and it will never be dug up again. Praise the Lord. This is why Paul can say, death is gain. No more sin. No more sin against the Lord that I love. But consider also, not just the fact that you'll be free from sin. Consider, brothers, what unity you will have with holiness after your death. You will not only be sin-free, you will be perfectly holy. Perfectly holy. After death, Hebrews 12, 23 says, the spirits of the righteous made perfect. When you go to heaven, even now, in the intermediate state, in heaven, not yet in the new earth, after your glorification, not even that, at the moment of death, your spirit goes to be with the Lord, your body goes into the ground, and your spirit is made perfect. Perfect in holiness. And then also after death, you will walk in perfect holiness. This is the imagery that God uses through Isaiah in Isaiah 35, 8. So Hebrews 12, 23, the spirits of the righteous made perfect. And then Isaiah 35, 8 shows that we will walk in perfect holiness. And a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way, even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. That's simply to encourage, encourage you to say, it doesn't matter who you are. If you're united to Christ, you will not go astray. Brothers, you will not only be totally free from sin, you will be made perfect in holiness. There's another, there's another test. Compare those two. I think for a true believer, you will be more excited about being free from sin than made perfect in holiness because you have so little experience with holiness. We're so imperfectly being sanctified and striving for holiness that we, we can't even fathom what it's like to be made perfect in holiness. It's like, that sounds excellent. But when you think about being free from sin, the reason that gets a believer really excited is because you are really acquainted with sin. And you've really come to hate your own sin, especially as you strive to be holy and you still sin. So you can examine yourself by that and say, I think I get even more excited about being free from sin than perfect in holiness because you have so little experience and so do I of what it looks like to really be holy. But nevertheless, your soul will be made perfect. You will walk in the way of holiness. Only ever doing, only ever thinking, only ever feeling that which gives pleasure to your king. That will be excellent. But consider not only freedom from sin, perfection and holiness, consider also where you will be and who you will be with after your death. Now a little bit of this, we're conflating the intermediate state in heaven with the new earth at the end. I'm conflating those a little bit here. It will be after your death, but some of these things are not immediately after your death until 
the second coming of the Lord Jesus and the judgment and the consummation of the kingdom. We'll conflate them, though, and just say, after your death, you'll experience this. I want you to consider the heavenly city and those who dwell there, all of which you will enjoy after death. After death, you will go to live in Christ's Father's house. Christ's Father's house. Christ says in John 14, too, In my Father's house are many rooms, or I love how the King James puts it, In my Father's house are many mansions. In the house are many mansions. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? After you die, you will go to live in Christ's Father's house. Secondly, after death, you will go to live in the sunlessly bright city, which has the tree of life and the lamb as its lamp. The sunlessly bright city, which has the tree of life and the lamb as its lamp. I say sunlessly bright because the brightness that's revealed in Revelation 21, but then also it says the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light and its lamp is the lamb. That could very easily mean we still have a sun and a moon, but we have no need of them because the brightness of the glory of God is shining forth. But I like to think of a sunlessly bright city. Its lamp is the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. The glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. The glory of the Lord shines through the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the city. In Revelation 22, 1 through 3, we read, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also, on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and His servants will worship Him. Meditate on that future state where you and I will live. In this consummated kingdom of Christ, we will worship God in the unadulterated splendor of holiness. We will actually perfectly be able to obey Psalm 29 too. I'm really excited for that day. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. We do that by the imputation of Christ's righteousness now But after our glorification, we will do that by the infusion of righteousness. We will not just be counted righteous. God will make us righteous. Third, as we consider the city and those who dwell there, after death, you will be surrounded by the elect angels and other saints made perfect. Have you even thought about the fact you're going to be surrounded by God's elect angels, get to speak to them, get to gaze upon even their beauty, and God will be glorified as you get to enjoy something He's created. You'll get to meet and speak with the angels and with other saints who have gone before you. Just think about the men that you've looked up to in church history. You'll get to meet them. You'll talk to them. Think about your loved ones who have died in Christ. You'll get to meet them and talk to them. Hebrews 12, 22 and 23. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all, And to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. After death, you'll be surrounded by the elect angels and other saints made perfect. Fourthly, concerning where you live and who you live with after your death, you will be reunited to your loved ones who died in Christ. You'll be reunited with your loved ones who've died in Christ. 1 Thessalonians 4, 
13 and 14. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. It means those who have presently died. That you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Those who've fallen asleep in Christ, that's, a, I think, the amazing thing about what Paul, how Paul talks about death. He calls it sleep. Because if you're united to the Lord Jesus Christ, it really is just like taking a nap that he'll wake you up from. You will be reunited with your loved ones. And I think the scriptures give us evidence that even your children who have died in infancy or died in utero, I think you'll see them. I think that's why we are given 2 Samuel 12, 23. 2 Samuel 12, 23, after David's son dies, he says, can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. Where's David going? And he's confident he's going to where his son is going. I think you should look at that verse and draw great comfort. As a believer, you should say, my kids are going where I'm going. And that's where I'm going. I think you're going to be reunited with even your children. Men, you'll get to experience that locale and all of those relationships after you die. You see why death is gain? That's way better. Now, what else do believers gain after death? What else do they gain after death? Well, fourthly, they gain rest. Believers gain rest. I want you to consider the actual rest that you will have after you die. And this is another way to examine yourself, I think, and to test yourself. How pumped do you get about these verses? If it's like, oh, yeah, it sounds okay. Are you working as hard as you should be? But I think these verses, for men especially, for men who have many duties, many responsibilities, like we do, these verses should pump you up. Hebrews 4.9, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. There's a Sabbath rest stored up for us men after death. George Whitfield, who worked so hard, he probably died a lot younger than he could have, some weeks preaching more than he slept. He's the guy who quipped, I would rather wear out than rust out. But he also said, how great will rest be after this fatigue? How great will heaven be after us travailing on the earth? And he knew that. So he read these verses and went, oh, I can't wait to rest. But right now, it's day. And we make hay while the sun is shining. Then we'll die and we'll rest. Today we live for Christ. Then we will rest with Christ. Revelation 4, or Hebrews 4 9, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Now I think this one's even sweeter. Revelation 14 13. Revelation 14 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Men, are you tired? I hope you're tired. I hope you're exhausting yourself to love your families, to love your wives, to love your children, to work hard in your vocation, to glorify the Lord. I hope you're tired. There remains a Sabbath rest for you. Blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on, that they may have rest from their labors. One day you will not be fighting sin anymore. You'll have rest. One day you will not be fighting to be holy anymore. You will have rest. One day you will not have to fight against the curse in your vocation to bring forth 
food by the sweat of your brow. You will, I think, still labor vocationally, but you will still have rest. You'll rest from your labors. Now, lastly, concerning why death is gained to a believer, we've saved the best for last. Consider, brothers, the shining face of Christ, which you will see with your own eyes after death. You will see the shining face of the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't get any better. This is why death is gained. The day you die, you shall be with Christ in paradise. Take what he says to the thief on the cross, take it to the bank. That's in the scripture for a reason. Not just so that we know he saved one of the thieves, but so that we know and we can be assured what happens when I die. Christ says, you'll be with me in paradise. You can see why Paul says, death is gain. Death is gain for the believer. Luke 23, 43. Jesus said to the thief on the cross, Truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Not only will you be with Christ, you'll see his face. It will not just be as Moses saw the Lord's back and his face shone from talking with the Lord and seeing just where the Lord had been even. You will see the Lord Jesus Christ's face. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. I think this is another reason why second commandment violations are so atrocious to me, so disgusting to me. When Christ is presented in some kind of picture or story, whatever it be, like, guys, this is the blessing. We get to see Jesus face to face. I don't want anything to get in the way of that or be a cheap imitation of that. We'll get to see Christ. Now it's in a mirror dimly. Keep it dim. It's supposed to be dim. Don't try to get it face to face. It's not that yet. But then it will be. Revelation 22.4 says the same thing as 1 Corinthians 13.12. Revelation 22.4, they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. In 1 Thessalonians 4, it says we will always be with the Lord. We will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Encourage one another. This is why, though Fanny Crosby lost her sight when she was a younger girl, which my daughter has corrected me on repeatedly because I thought she was born blind, she lost her sight at a younger time or an earlier time in her life, and she heard people praying for her to recover her sight, and she told him to stop. She wants the very next thing she sees to be the face of Jesus. She knew those promises, and she couldn't wait to see him face to face. So how do we make use of this? Let me give you warning, examination, rebuke, comfort, and exhortation. The warning that you should draw from this passage and to live is Christ and to die is gain is this. If you are not united to Christ by faith alone, in Him alone, death is not gain for you. Death is not gain for you unless you are united to Jesus through faith. He has paid for your sins. His righteousness has been imputed to you. Anyone whose faith is not in Christ alone, death is not gain for them. Death is gain only for the believer. Death is the end of all terrors for believers, but I believe it's in Job that he says, or maybe it's Ezekiel, that death is the king of terrors to an unbeliever. The king of terrors is death. So use that warning. Help other people see Show them the great blessings and benefits of belonging to Jesus and then warn them. If they're an unbeliever, warn them. Your death will not be gained. This life will be as good as it ever gets. And you will die and you'll be thrown into hell and you will get for an eternity every second what you deserve for your sin. 
The fire will never burn out. The wrath will never be satisfied. This is what you deserve for your rebellion against your creator. And then tell them to go to Christ and your death can be turned into gain. Examine yourselves also. Can you say with Paul, to die is gain? You really say that. If you knew you were going to die tomorrow, do you trust the Lord enough to take care of your family? Can you still say, death is gain? It's better to depart and be with Christ. Or do you have some bucket list things that you really want to get done? Because somehow you think that's better than being with the Lord Jesus. I'm not trying to get you to shirk your responsibilities or say, I want to leave everyone hanging. That's not what I'm talking about. Can you really say, death is gain? Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Can you say, come and take me? In Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, at the very end, death is the river that must be crossed to get to the celestial city. And it's as if Christian, the, the character, must be willing to drown in the river to get to heaven. That's the picture that Bunyan presents. Men, this rings true, doesn't it? You gotta to get to the celestial city, you gotta be willing to drown. You gotta be you have to die. But can you, like Christian, enter that river, though death is frightening, but knowing the celestial city is on the other side? You say, Death is gain. I have a champion who's gone into the grave and got out of the grave and told me that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I have nothing to be concerned about. Death is is gain. If you do not say to die is gain, you need to be rebuked. Because somehow you think that your idea of what should happen or even this life that you're living, somehow you think that's better with being than being with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let that serve to rebuke you. If you cannot say to die is absolutely gain, then what I would ask you if that's you, what has stolen your affections? Have you abandoned your first love? To die is gain because you get to be with Jesus. Teach your family that. Teach your wife that. Teach your children that. If you can't say to live is Christ, now let that serve as a rebuke to you as well. You can't just be sitting on your hands and say, well, to die is gain. I just can't wait to die. You need to be able to say the first part of that too. To live is Christ. To die is gain, I'm hard-pressed between the two. Like Paul says, if I live, that means I'm fruitful labor and I'm going to work hard for God's glory, for other people's good. And if I die, I get to go and be with Jesus. That's way better, but I'm hard-pressed between the two. You need to be able to say both. To live is Christ, to die is gain. But draw comfort from this verse as well, men. You who believe, meditate on the fact that harms will be healed. There are no harms that have happened to you or any other believers in this life that Christ will not heal. All harms will be healed. All wrongs will be made right. The just God will vindicate his holiness and vindicate his saints. If Christ stood in your place, men, see him now. Imagine him resurrected and standing next to your deathbed. Imagine him standing next to your deathbed. See his arms outstretched as your breath starts to fade away. See him holding each of these promises we've looked at tonight, written with blood on a blessed scroll. Hear him saying to your dying soul, look how much I paid to make your death gain. See Christ saying, Look at my cross and look how much I paid to turn your death into gain. You won't be able to help but rejoice. If you see what a gain your death is and what Christ paid on the cross to make your death gain, you'll be able to easily say with Paul, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain.
So my exhortation to close is just two things. Meditate on these truths and teach those in your charge. Teach those under your care why death is gain for a believer. And don't be dismayed when your younger children or any of your children for a while are saying, I do not want to die. Give it time. Be patient. That's, a, I think, a very natural, and that's not a bad sign to say, I do not want to die. It's fearful. Teach these truths to your wife, your children, Christ's church. Teach it to the nations. And I beg you to meditate on these truths and say with Paul to live as Christ and to die as gain. May God grant us the ability to do that. Pray with me. Our Father, we ask you to help us understand what Paul is saying here and to experience the same, the same kind of thoughts and desires as he did to say to live is Christ and to die is gain. We long for the day when we will see you face to face. We long for the day when we will rest from all of our labors and we thank you for your promises. Christ, thank you for standing in our place and taking the punishment that we deserve for our sins so that our death would not transport us to hell, but our death would be the transportation to your presence. Help us to meditate on these and teach these to others. In Christ's name, amen. All right, men, let's stand up and sing Psalm 16, 7 through 11. Psalm 16, verses 7 through 11, to the tune of All Hail, the Power of Jesus' Name. I bless the Lord because he doth by counsel me conduct. And in the seasons of the night my reins to me instruct. Within the seasons of the night my reins to me Sith it is so that he doth ever stand at my right hand, I shall not move it be. Doth ever stand at my right hand, I shall not move it be. Because of this my heart shall be expressed, even by my glory and my flesh, in confidence shall rest, even by my glory and my flesh, in confidence shall rest, because my soul in grave to dwell shall not be left by thee, nor wilt thou give thine holy one corruption to see, nor wilt thou give thine holy one corruption to Before thy face at thy right hand are pleasures evermore. Before thy face at thy right hand are pleasures evermore. Our Father in heaven, glory be to your name. 
Help us be glad and rejoice and say with Paul, your saint, to 